All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, we're gonna talk about this. A Winchester 1894 lever action rifle in 3030 Winchester. Now, in order to talk about this, we need to dive into some history. And actually, this is going to be a deeper dive than what I normally do. As it turns out, this rifle in general has actually quite a storied history, and I feel like there's a lot that we need to talk about with this in order to be able to appreciate the lineage of this rifle. So, if that's not what you're into and you would prefer to hear the specifics about this particular rifle as well as my thoughts and opinions on it, then go ahead and check the description. I will have annotated when the actual review starts. Now, for the rest of you who are actually kind of interested in how much history a lever-action hunting rifle could possibly have, go ahead, pause this video, grab yourself a tasty beverage and perhaps a snack, and come join me for the history of the Winchester 94 lever-action rifle. Now, lever-action rifle history in general starts in earnest in 1860 with the Henry lever action rifle. Now there was the Volcanic that predated that, however it was not nearly as successful as the Henry lever action was. In 1866, Winchester came out with their first lever action rifle, which was different from the Henry in that it was side loading, as opposed to loading from the front of the tubular magazine. And this was kind of how Winchester more or less made their popularity and became the rifle that won the West. Now, throughout this time, these rifles were pistol caliber rifles because, as it turns out, it's extremely difficult to fit a larger rifle caliber in these receivers. These are not exactly space-efficient designs. However, in 1886, John Moses Browning designed a 4570 lever-action rifle for Winchester. And this rifle could have netted itself some military contracts that the French had not designed smokeless powder in that very same year. Already the vast majority of militaries were moving towards repeating rifles, but smokeless powder drastically changed that overall process because now you can engage at greater distances with a smaller, faster moving projectile instead of having to stick with 40, minimum of 40 caliber bullets being lobbed at whatever combat distances you manage to be able to engage them with. So, that, that was a pretty big deal. There were a lot of people who were scrambling to try to keep up and change things. Also, as it turns out, the vast majority of rifles at the time built for black powder cartridges did not have the necessary lockup to be, to, to be able to sustain the pressures of a smokeless powder round. Smoke, smokeless powder is extremely rapid and much higher burning powder than black powder is. So your locking lugs and stuff like that in your action are, are gonna take a lot of pressure and a lot of load. And black powder rifles at the time, for the most part, were not up to that. A lot of them had a single locking lug for their lockup, which is just fine for black powder. It will not work long term for smokeless powder. Now, surprisingly enough, the 1886 lever action actually had strong enough lockup, which is, I guess, not a shock when you consider who it is that designed it. It was the barrel that was the issue with smokeless powder, and Winchester quickly fixed that. However, it did take a while for smokeless powder cartridges to really reach the civilian market. Now, Winchester did have John Moses Browning design the 1892 lever action, which was supposed to be a shrunk down 1886 for pistol caliber bullets. But they really wanted to get something in the market for a more modern, higher velocity smokeless powder small bore cartridge. And what they did was have John Moses Browning develop the 1894 lever action with two things in mind. One, safer lockup for smokeless powder cartridges, and two, they wanted a rifle caliber to be able to go into this rifle in a short, light overall package. Well, and that is what JMB designed for them. So, initially, the 1894 lever action rifle came out in 3855, and I think the other cartridge was 2530, both of which are black powder cartridges. But by 1895, they had the 3030 cartridge ready to go and chambered in this rifle. So, they got everything they wanted out of this. They got their small bore smokeless powder cartridge and lever action design, and were more than competitive with Marlin, who they've been kind of trading 
back and forth in the market with with each of their advancements, most recent advancements in design. Now, this would pretty much be the extent of the intrigue in this rifle had World War I not kicked off. Now, 1914, World War I kicks off and all of the militaries involved very quickly realize that they had not been aggressive enough in rifle production prior to the start of the war. And that a war of attrition is not just about manpower as much as it's about equipment. During this war, countries like Russia would come to realize that rifles were more precious than gold. Especially when you consider that they were being gobbled up in no man's land, swept over by machine guns from soldiers attempting to breach those same positions, or churned up in the mud by artillery strikes all across the front line. Everybody embroiled in that war were having issues keeping enough rifles in service. So, what a lot of them wound up doing was reaching out to other countries for help in production of their service rifles and adopting mid-war ad hoc rifles to try to make them better suited for the actual fighting it was that they were dealing with. Well, the Winchester 1894 would find its way into that conflict, first with the British, who decided to issue them to their navy so that they could free up more of their Lee Enfields for the front line. Then the French took out a contract by about 1916 for several thousand, multi-digit thousand rifles for use by couriers and artillerymen, guys that were not seeing frontline fighting but still needed a rifle of some sort in case they became embroiled in the conflict. Again, freeing up more rifles for the front. Now, by 1917, when the U.S. entered the war, they realized that they needed to expand production for the construction of aircraft. They needed a lot more wood for the frames of the aircraft. So that demand went up, which inevitably led to a worker strike at the lumber camps in Washington. Well, this was handled by the United States Army Signal Corps, who sent out about 1,500 guys armed with Winchester 1894 rifles to quell the disturbance and get production back underway. Now, you can tell the French service rifles by them having side sling swivels, and a lot of them will have Belgian markings because they, when France offloaded the rifles, they got routed through Belgium for distribution uh, on the civilian market. The U.S. Army models you'll be able to tell by a f ordnance flaming bomb stamp on the rear barrel band, as well as them being in the 800,000 serial number range. Now, here's a very important thing, guys, and I've talked about this before with military surplus type rifles. You have to be extremely careful with anybody who claims to have a military surplus rifle of a certain vintage, especially when it's something so niche as a 3030 1894. There's a very good chance that they might be trying to lead you astray. So, never impulse buy any surplus rifle, especially something so rare as a service Winchester 1894. Get as much information as you can off the rifle and do the research. There's a ton of information out there on these these specific service rifles. You can find serial number ranges and features and all that kind of stuff for you to be able to properly grade that rifle and make sure someone's not trying to take you for a loop. Especially when you consider that a World War I service Winchester 1894 is going to demand a premium. Someone will try to get you to pay through the nose and you need to make sure that they're not faking it because that is not uncommon in surplus rifles, especially something so collectible. So be very careful. Never impulse buy. All right, so that sums up World War I. Now, by World War II, it seems that pretty much everyone who got involved in that conflict had already taken the appropriate steps to make sure they had enough rifle production going into the war, and you only really see an issue with rifle production near the end of the war for those who were losing. However, the Canadian Mounties did take on the Winchester 1894 in case of Japanese invasion on Canadian shores, which never happened, so wasn't really a consideration in that case. Our next most notable footnote in the history of this particular rifle comes in 1963 when the previous owner of Winchester steps down. Now that's, this is kind of disastrous for Winchester because that man was a firearms enthusiast and a sports shooter and he strove to make sure that Winchester remained high quality in its production. The new owner decided that he wanted to make the company more lucrative, so he sought to cut some corners 
and design features in order to make it so that they could produce the rifles more cheaply. And this is where we get the post-64 Winchester rifles, and specifically with the Winchester 1894, we see a couple of new changes. So we see a centered steel receiver, a hollow receiver pins, as well as a change to the lifter, which I think was like a cast part or something like that. Now, honestly, out of those parts, the only one I really care about is the receiver. The other two are, the, I don't really care about the pins. Those, those shouldn't be an issue. And then the lifter is a low impact part. There's no reason that I would expect to see lifters wear out because they're cast or made of a lesser quality metal. That, that seems like a, a reasonable place to try to cut some costs. But the receiver wound up being the undoing and we'll get into that more thoroughly. However, because of these changes, Pre-1964 Winchester 94 rifles demand a premium. They are extremely valuable and you will pay well beyond what you will for a post-64 copy. It happens, guys. Uh, they're extremely collectible and desirable guns, kind of like John uh, JM or John Marlin, I think it's John, stamped barrels are today. So... You kind of got to take the good with the bad on that one, and we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. So, unfortunately for Winchester, all of these cost-saving measures that they took with not just this model, but their other ones, didn't really save the company, and in 1981, they became the United States Repeating Arms Company using Winchester as a name brand. Now, during this time, the Winchester name brand attempted to diversify the Winchester 94, they dropped the 1894 moniker and just called it the 94 by producing it in more cartridges. And honestly, throughout its production life, the, the rifle had already been coming out in different cartridges. By 1902, it came out in the 32 Winchester Special. Throughout this time, it also became chambered in all of the common uh, lever action pistol cartridges that you'd expect to see it chambered in, as well as in the 90s, the 9422 and the 9410, which were a 22 long rifle and 410 variant of the Winchester 94s, respectively, came out as well. Now, in 2006, the Winchester name ram was bought out once again by FN Herstel of Belgium which closed down production until 2010 when Winchester 94 started getting produced again, this time in Mor Moroku, excuse me, Japan. And that is where we are today. So, go ahead and welcome back our uh, people who advanced to the actual review portion of this video. And really, if you've been with me for a little bit, go ahead and pause, refresh on your drink and your snack, and join up with me here again in a second. All right, let's talk about this particular rifle, and we'll talk about some of the aspects associated with it, all right? So, this is a 20-inch barreled 3030 Winchester chambered rifle. Winchester would initially refer to the 3030 Winchester as the 30 Winchester Centerfire, or WCF, so that can kind of give you an idea of how old a rifle is as to whether or not that is stamped on the barrel. The tubular magazine holds seven rounds. The front sight is a hooded blade front sight, with a inset uh, bronze bead w to help you kind of pick up that sight a little easier. We have a add-on sling swivel to the magazine tube there. Our rear sight is a buckhorn ramped adjustable rear sight with a white triangle set into it. And I'll get you guys close-ups of these sights so that uh, you know where to put the front sight in case you forget you got a little white triangle right there to tell you now we have pretty good wood for the handstock and the uh, excuse me the forearm and the buttstock combining words here which is one thing i appreciate from winchester they did not drop their quality on their wood However, they did on the receiver. So I mentioned before that this was a centered steel receiver. And the way that you can pick out a centered steel receiver from across the room is the fact that the finish looks terrible. And that is because centered steel does not take blued finishing very well. 
it just rubs right off of the rifle in the worst ways possible. So pretty much, I, I feel very confident in saying that pretty much every Winchester 94 produced post 64 with the centered steel receiver is going to have some major finish wear, probably some rusting, well, definitely some rusting and probably some pitting. So that's something you have to look out for there. This rifle right now has some rust on it and I'm constantly fighting it. I'm constantly trying to keep up with it and it's just a never ending battle. And that is why pre-64 rifles demand a premium and why it's fairly cheap to pick up post-64 rifles like this one, which is fine if you're just looking to have a representation of Americana with a Winchester in your, in your collection to begin with. But if you're looking for an actual quality rifle, I highly recommend the pre-64s when it comes to finish. Function is fine. This rifle functions just fine. There's no issues with that. But when it comes to finish, if you want something that is visually appealing and gives you some pride and ownership, you're gonna want a, a pre-64. You're also gonna pay for it. So there's that. Now this is a top ejecting rifle, extremely common for Winchesters of this era, which is problematic from a scope mounting standpoint. Now, this rifle, is drilled for a scope and at one point it did have a side mounted scope so that you would have space to be able to allow the cartridge to eject because if you go with a centrally mounted scope your cartridge is just going to slam in the bottom of the scope pop back down into the chamber and gum up all your mechanics so you had to go with this with the side mounted option for the most part now i got rid of it eventually because side mounted scopes run into a weird issue with cheek weld as well as parallax and it's just not worth it to me at the end of the day not for the distances that this rifle is really meant for which is like 200 yards i think i can hit a target at 200 yards with iron sights just saying so eventually winchester did produce their xtr which was the winchester 94 xtr which gave you 45 degree ejection instead of straight up 90 like in the original, which was supposed to be able to accommodate the attachment of the scope. Now you will also sometimes see these rifles drilled and tapped on the rear in order to be able to place a Lyman peep sight on the back of it. This was an extremely common practice because the buckhorn rear sights suck. They're, they're really not that great. They're not my favorite by any means. And a Lyman peep sight would be a much better sight picture. However, I don't, well, first off, this isn't tapped for it. And second off, I don't like adding things to older rifles. These are, these sights are perfectly usable, even if they're not my favorite. And I'm not, I'm not bothered by them enough to replace them with the Lyman. Now let's go ahead and talk about what it is that John Moses did John Moses Browning, mind you, did to make this rifle so revolutionary because this is an extremely small and lightweight, roughly five pound rifle that is able to fully feed and chamber a 30-30 cartridge. Now, why is that so important? Well, as I mentioned before, these are not efficient in space. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in a lever action rifle right in this area. Even a pump action shotgun at the very least moves some of that to beneath the barrel and around the magazine tube. That's a little more space efficient, space efficient than a lever action rifle ever is. There's a lot of internal moving parts in here that generally preclude, in a short receiver, preclude the application of a rifle cartridge. Well, John Moses Browning took a look at it and said, well, maybe I can create some space. And create space he did by allowing the entire bottom of the receiver to drop out of the rifle, that gave space for a longer cartridge to move into the lifter, and then upon closing, when you're finished cycling the action, brought it straight into the chamber. So it was an extremely efficient use of space overall. Now it's a terrible use of space if you think about trying to keep dirt and mud out of the internals and all that kind of stuff, which is why this never saw frontline use. However, from a efficiency of trying to get a, a bigger cartridge into the gun in a smaller overall package this is brilliant this is absolutely amazing so simple a solution yet it took years decades for someone to finally come up with it or at least do it right now you will see some later production winchester 94s with a frame mounted safety and you see a lot of people get really upset about this because apparently the only safety you should have on a lever action rifle is the half cock position on the hammer. And people get like 
ridiculously mad about frame mounted safeties on lever action rifles. I've never understood it. Safeties on rifles are not a thing that I really get worked up about. You want to talk about some handgun safeties? I'll, I'll meet you there. We're going to have a discussion about that. But frame mounted safeties were never really a big deal to me. Now, a lot of people refer to them as the lawyer safety, saying that, oh, that's just, you know, what someone did to appease, you know, some legislature somewhere. Well, from what I understand, Winchester added a safety like that because it made it more viable for export, which, I mean, if you want your, the company that you like to stick around, they've got to be lucrative, so they've got to be able to export their products. Just something to think about. Now, I will meet the complaint because the Morocco design guns moved their safety to the Tang, and I dislike that purely because I think it disrupts the lines of the rifle, where I don't feel the same about it mounted to the receiver. I, I, I find that to be very low profile type setup, whereas the tang mounted safety just, it bothers me. It disrupts the flow of the rifle. That's just my own personal opinion. Now when it comes to safeties, this rifle does have a grip safety, which is odd. At least to many people this will be odd. So right here, we have this little pin. Now when you have the rifle cocked, if you do not have that pin depressed, you cannot pull the trigger, as you can see there. So that's, it's got a safety regardless, and I can, I can understand that argument and such, but grip safeties are never good loan safeties. They're good in conjunction with something else. All right, guys, well, here's the rifle. So how does it shoot? Well, I think an important thing to keep in mind anytime we talk about the accuracy of an open-sided 30-30 lever action rifle is that we're not talking about some sort of crazy precision. This rifle is minute of man or deer at best. That, that is all that it's required to do. It is not meant to be some crazy long-range rifle. With this cartridge, this is generally considered to be a 200-yard rifle. And with open sights, that's reasonable. Now, there is something that I should talk about with this rifle specifically when it comes to my opinions and use for it that I think is very important to clarify right off the bat. So, probably a year and a half ago, I took this rifle shooting one day, realized that I had never really disassembled it for a good clean, so that's what I did. I found a video, took it all apart, cleaned it, put it back together, and then discovered that everything was stiff. And not only was it stiff, but my trigger squeeze, my trigger brake had gone up to like 20 pounds. And I, I was having trouble getting the safety to release. So, thinking that I had done something wrong, I took the gun apart again and put it back together, trying to make sure that I followed everything perfectly. And if anything, my trigger squeeze went up and it became even harder to get the grip safety to engage. So I took the gun apart a third time, put it back together, and though the trigger squeeze lightened a little bit, it was still far heavier than it was supposed to be, and I was still having issues with the grip safety. So at this point, I took it into a gunsmith. I explained to him what happened, and he took it from me, scolding me to never, ever, ever, ever disassemble a Winchester 94 rifle. Apparently, this is not meant to be done at the user level. This is meant to be done by a professional or someone who really knows what it is that they're doing. So if you have one of these or are looking to buy one of these, I would implore you to not detail strip it or disassemble it at all and just swab whatever it is that you can reach. And if it becomes extremely gummed up, take it to a gunsmith. That's what I learned the hard way. Now, what do I use this rifle for? Well, I got this rifle to use as a hunting rifle. However, where I live now, I've been making over 200 yard shots on game, so I don't consider that to be ethical for this rifle and cartridge. I have not taken it out into the woods. I, at one point, did have it sitting on my ready rack as a home defense gun. However, the 3030 cartridge is like a freight train flying through the air, and at close range, I'm definitely probably going to over penetrate a target and potentially shoot the neighbor's dog. So I took it down off of the ready rack. So really, I keep this around as a hunting option for future places I may live. 
but really it's just kind of a fun gun something to enjoy that that cowboy aspect of lever action rifles you know the name winchester and all that kind of stuff it, it is an extremely enjoyable rifle to shoot very light recoiling and i have managed to push 30 30 lever actions out to 400 yards and hit steel so consistently mind you so i i do enjoy playing around with this seeing how far i can push it now what do i recommend this rifle to you for well i guess that depends if you live in an apartment or in a suburb, I do not recommend it as a home defense gun. However, if you lived in a more rural area, this would be an excellent home defense gun, if not ATV or truck gun for whenever you're putting about your land doing whatever it is that you need to do in order to maintain it. You know, having this sitting up with you on a combine or something like that, that could actually be fairly fun. Take a couple pot shots at something, be it predators or tree stumps, whatever. Um, for like a target rifle, I don't think this is a great choice. They're just, it's not that impressive of a shooter overall. You're not going to sit here splitting hairs with your friends about whether or not you can get one MOA out of this rifle, or at least I wouldn't advise that. Let's see. Hunting rifle. These have been used for decades as hunting rifles to great success, especially in places of heavy brush cover like out east or in the northwest of the country where there's a lot of thick foliage. These have been fantastic rifles. And in that regard, when it comes to hunting, I would consider this to be absolutely perfect for whitetail or black bear. However, pushing it to bigger game starts to become a question of how close can I get to it and only taking those shots that close in order to be ethical in what it is that you're doing, which open sights on this gun would be a pretty fantastic choice for. Now, if I lived in Alaska, I would consider this to be an excellent defensive rifle, should I be out fishing or something along those lines, because I would be expecting to engage a predator at fairly close range to where this cartridge would still have a lot of energy to transmit and be able to put that target down. If 10 millimeter Glocks are acceptable for Alaskan brush, then a five pound 30-30 rifle most definitely is. Now there is one more interesting option, one that I've not really looked into or pursued, but it's become kind of popular in a niche part of the market in the past couple of years, and that has been tactical space looking lever action rifles. There are manufacturers out there now, I don't know if they make them for Winchester 94s, but they make them for lever action rifles, where you can get an M-Lock forearm for your lever action rifle. And from there you can mount lights and optics and lasers and all kinds of stuff that you might want to mount to the rifle. And in a place where you can get free and easy access to semi-automatic rifles of good use for defensive type applications or life and liberty type guns, I don't think that's a anything beyond kind of a giggle factor application. You know, if you can access AR-15s and AK-47s in your normal application, 30 round magazines, adjustable stocks, none of the band type features on them, then I, that's what you should do. You should not pursue this as a serious fighting rifle. However, if you're in a location where that's not free and easy access for you, this might be a fairly interesting option at that point, especially in the 3030, because when you compare other cartridges that this is loaded in, 3030 is pretty cheap. It's definitely cheaper than 357 Magnum or 45 Colt, 44 Magnum, any of those. Uh, generally, I pay 15 to $21 a box for 3030, depending on what's going on in the world. So that's, that's definitely cheaper than all of the above. And if you think about it, it's kind of a short range lever action AR-10 at that point. It, that could be kind of fun. I could, I could see this being applicable as long as you could get lights and optics and stuff attached to it. It would be a fairly decent fighting rifle if you couldn't have anything else. Something to think about there. I'm not saying that this is a thing that you should do. This is not something I'm advocating as much as an option that I'm throwing out there for you. Well, guys, we've made it to the ending finally. So I'm really glad for any of you who hung in there with me and for you guys who went ahead and cut the corner. I hope at some point you decide you want to go back and check out the history aspect of this video because I do think, at least to me, it's interesting. But either way, 
no matter how it is that we got to this point, have a good day.